this training will help you to understand better the basic requirements and also the basic equipment tools and processes for creating and submitting videos. Many of you think that amazing videos need all sorts of Hollywood standard requirements and you know big cameras and uh, mixers and etc. I'm sure you'll be surprised by the end of this training when Wilfred shares his story about some of the work that he has done and also share some idea around how to make these things with simple devices like a mobile phone. Uh, we encourage every one of you to pay attention, ask questions at the end of the session. You can, uh, if you, so that you don't forget the questions, you can type them out in the chat and then we will ask them all generally at the end of the, the session. So uh, thank you all once again for joining us. I'd like to invite Wilfred now to take over and uh, amaze us with all the, the glory of, of what it means or how it, what's necessary to create a video for, for Wikilove's Africa. Uh, Wilfred? Hello, Wilfred. I'm here. The floor is yours and, um, now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is this, by the way, before we begin, my this is my very first um, Zoom meeting and workshop online, and I'm so excited I'm doing this. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, so today we are going to be learning about um, videography basics for Wikilove's Africa. Um, well, it's dedicated for Wikilove's Africa. I'm just going to try and do my best to give out as much as possible so we can hopefully by the end of this training have as many people submitting quality videos for this year's um, contest. So I am going to be sharing a slide. It's very basic, straightforward, no, no big dramatic thing going on with it. So I would like you to pay more attention to the tips I'll be giving while going through these slides. Um, these slides also contain hyperlinks. Um, by the end of the training, um, via Wilson, he's going to help me share the slide so we can all have access to it afterwards. I'm going to further develop it before we share it. Um, so these slides contain hyperlinks, like some topics contain hyperlinks that would lead you to an in-depth, to give you details about these things that I'm talking about, especially on the wiki, um, Wikipedia platform and on YouTube. So you can see some YouTube videos about certain things as well. So it's not so much of images and all going on in there. So let's begin. Let me share the slide right now. Okay, try and navigate. All right. So, um, so we're going to be talking about the videography basics. And this is, like I said earlier, dedicated for the contest. And um, yeah, me, this is my contact basically. Um, just a brief info about me. I am um, a filmmaker from Boni River State in Nigeria. I live in Port Harcourt, the capital city of River State. And I began my videography journey way back in 2019. Um, a little background, a, a little backstory. I initially started off as a hobby. I started doing it as a hobby um, with my phone, but I saw it as something I wanted to chase. I saw it as a passion I wanted to carry off to the end. I wanted to see the end of it. But I started off somewhere, I started small and with phones, I would make some videos, put them together and share. And my friends would say, oh, it's fine, it's cool. And then later on in 2020, I decided to take it up a notch. Um, and I learned how to use a proper camera, how to do editing, proper editing on an editing um, interface on, on, on laptops, on PC. Initially, I did all my editing on the phone. So I'll be sharing some insights on that as well, on how we can use our phones to create like videos that we can actually submit for the contest as well. Now, um, you don't actually need like the best of equipment because where I started from, even my very first submission, I had almost nothing, right? 
I had almost nothing. How I did business, I rent equipment, I do business, I deliver. That's how it's been before the contest. And it was the same thing I did for the contest. I rented the equipment I used, I did the, I, I made the, the, the short film. Um, but I made sure it suit, it was in line with the theme of the year. And at the time it was home and habitat, but I was like, okay, how best can I tell a story about home that is going to convey something meaningful, something that is going to make an impact because I'm about, I'm all about making films that actually make an impact in a way or the other. So I thought about it that way. So I decided to come up with a story instead of going the conventional way. I came up with a story, but I dug deep down to myself rather than, well, it's all around me. It, it's what's happening around me. So I dug deep. It was more of my story and how I came, how I grew up as a single mother, but in the film, it was a single dad. So I decided to come up with a story and, um, and fortunately I won for that year. The same thing for last year. It was all story based and i think that is like the major thing that we need to actually focus on when creating these contents we might want them to be as simple as possible but then let them have some sort of story going on in there i think it makes your your video stand out even more well that's it for me let's move on um wilson had already mentioned that what our expectations are for this particular session and it's basically written here so we move on so on the content we as you can see we're going to talk about what videography is basic videography equipment camera settings uh, both for cameras and for both for cameras and for phones as well understanding composition and how it plays a role in storytelling and all of that the elements of composition types of composition um so Working with lights, how to use light, um, the importance of light, three-point lighting technique for those who are going to be filming indoors. So that's where the three-point lighting techniques come to play. That is if you have access to lights. And then things to consider when shooting outdoors. Now, the first form of lighting we have, of course, is natural lighting. And we need to know when and how to shoot on the, the natural light, of course, that we have, which is the sun, which comes from the sun. And then we're going to have a conversation about storytelling. And then we get into editing, the type of apps you need to edit. If it's on PC, if it's on, if it's using a phone, uh, we get to cutting, how to cut and piece together your clips, choosing the right music because you need the right music um, to convey um, emotions for each moment, to actually carry each moment. Then um, we talk about the impact of sound effects and what color has to do with all of this, how it helps convey a story as well, and then um, uploading to comments. Um, Wilson, you might have to support me there at some point. <laughs> but anyways, it's quite simple to upload to comments. It's as simple as clicking a few buttons, filling in some details, and you're good to go. But as long as you pay attention to uh, um, the rules for the contest, you'll be good to go. All right, so let's begin introduction to videography what is videography sorry let me move this panel a little bit out of my way all right so videography is the process of capturing moving images with a camera to a film a disc or a data storage device right now what we are saying here is you're capturing moving images now the difference between videography and photography is the fact that the images now are moving. Now these images that are moving, they are actual images. Each frame is an image. Now, if you're an editor, if you've edited anything at all, as a matter of fact, you don't even need to edit anything. Play a video and pause the video at intervals. Each time you pause that video, that video in itself is a picture. It's an image. It's a single image. So now, in videography, we are not just dealing with single a single image as in photography. Now in videography, we are dealing with moving images. So that's basically the difference between videography and photography. Now in videography, you're capturing it with a camera. Now the camera can be anything, any kind of camera, actually. It could be a digital camera. 
um, a DSLR camera, it could even be your phone because the camera on your phone is a camera, of course. So that's basically it for videography and what videography is. Now we are going to be talking about a few other things. Sorry, let me move this panel. Um, basic videography equipment. So there are some equipments you need, basic equipments you need for videography. Now you don't need the most expensive um, um, mainstream um, equipments to do videography, to film anything. Basically what you need is a camera, which is the first thing up there. Like I said earlier, um, this document comes with hyperlinks. So the hyperlinks, as you can see, the, the texts in blue are hyperlinked. So they will, if you click on it, it will take you to a page or a video where you get to learn more about camera. So this document, Uh, is that me? Am I the only one? See, of course. It's that general. Is that? Say that again, please. I think you froze for a minute there, but it's fine. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. What did we miss? I hope we didn't miss much. <laughs> okay, so so we are talking about cameras. Um, so there are different types of cameras. Course, but almost any camera can be used, compared and paired with the right kind of lenses, can be used to tell a good story. So we have lenses. You need variable lenses. Um, and somebody, the noise is interrupting. Please mute your mics. Okay. So the variable lenses there are different types of lenses that can be used in different kind of scenarios right so there are different lenses for different scenarios to tell different kind of story for instance if i want to take a wide shot of a space say an establishing shot of a space i'll need to take a lens i use a lens that is wide enough to cover up the space the type of wide lenses that even if i get close enough i still have enough real estate when I'm looking through the camera, I know that I have enough space, right? So there are different kinds of lenses for different kinds of moments. Just like you have for, um, in, photo, um, in portrait photography, most of the kind of lenses they use are 80, 70 millimeter lenses, 50 millimeter lenses, 80 millimeter lenses, those type of lenses that is going to take someone close up and blow out the background, of course. So those are the kind of lenses they use there. So that's for that kind of scenario. So there are different type of lenses for different type of scenarios that give different kind of effects. So even for mobile phones, there are different type of lenses as well that you can attach to the lens of your phone, and then it gives it that effect. So they're like glasses you add, you add to your camera, it gives it that effect. So there, that's what lenses are. Um, then you need storage devices, of course, with our phones. The memory card in our phone, the phone has memory on its own, so you record it stores directly to the phone. But when it comes to cameras, you would need um, a storage device. So it could be a card or an SSD that is connected directly to the camera. And um, for film cameras, and I don't know if there are still people using, like regular people using film cameras. Um, I know there are some film cameras due to some director's preference. They still use them for making proper films, like in movie sets, in cinema, in proper cinema. Um, so those type of cameras, you record directly to the film. The film, then you can print the film. They, use the, they take the films, process it into a movie, right? So th those are like the three major ways you can store um, your footages. And then we have a video tripod. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be clicking most of these so we can at least have an idea of what these look like. Um, can you see can you see my screen? I'm not sure I'm doing this right. Share. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. 
Okay. All right. Yes. All right. Great. So this is what a typical video camera looks like. Um, is it going to be a problem if um, we show some contents that are, oh boy, <laughs> navigating here is a little bit of a problem, okay. All right, I'm back here. So this is typically what a video camera looks like. Right, most of those cameras that have the handles, most of the, sorry, video tripod looks like. So most of the video tripods have a handle on them. So you know that, oh, this is a video tripod. And then the ones for camera, especially for photography rather, um, don't have that kind of handle, this particular handle you see here. And the reason for that is that you can make some movement with the tripod while the camera is mounted on it. So you can tilt up and down, or and then you can pan left and right. Tilting is up and down, panning is left and right. Um, you can do that when you are following a subject. Let's say the subject is moving from left to right. You pan by holding the handle here and turning it left and right. So that's basically what, why you have that handle there. This is typically what a tripod looks like, a video tripod looks like. And I use this for... Um, I used it for, I would like to show you something right here. Can you see the screen? Yep. All right. So let me take it down to this point. So this is me using um, a video tripod. Like I said earlier, you're going to, it has a handle. Um, the reason for having a tripod in the first place, the first, in the first place, why you need a tripod is to give your camera stability so you can take still shots, stable shots. Because if you look through certain videos, you would notice there are some shots that are stable and then there are some shots that are moving. So the shots that are still, they are mostly mounted on a tripod. Now, the reason why we need to mount our cameras on the tripod again is so your shots are stable because the human hand is really not stable. No matter how hard you try, the footages are still going to be shaky and then you're, you wouldn't have a, a, a smooth footage at the end of the day. Now, this also applies for um, phones. There are phone tripods that are specifically made for phones. So you mount your phone on it and you do your filming. <clears throat> So that's exactly what I was trying to achieve here, a stable shot for this particular scene. And I am going to go back and show you exactly how that turned out um, in Good Yesterdays, the submission I made last year. All right, so this is the exact scene. Let me go back a bit. So this is the exact scene I shot on the tripod, the exact scene you just saw me shooting um, in the illustration I just showed not long ago. So as you can see, sorry, excuse me. As you can see here, this shot is stable. It isn't shaky. But this other shot, I was filming on a gimbal. I will get to that shortly. Also, at this point, it was on a gimbal because I needed to make some camera movements. And this shot, before it goes off here, was also on the tripod. It was the same shot from beginning till the end. So that's the importance of using a tripod. But then you need to know the moments you need to move your camera or when you don't need to move your camera. And that is where both the gimbal and the tripod comes to play. The gimbal, you use a gimbal when you need to move your camera, you need to make movement, not just the camera, but you yourself, you need to get closer to your subject or you need to follow the subject while moving. But with a tripod, it's for stable shots. But then there are moments when you need to do stable shots and then there are moments when you need to follow the subject. So that's where they both come to play. Um, so moving on, um, that's for video tripod. And then we have video lights, of course. Um, video lights, the 
they are continuous lights. They are not like the type of lighting you use in photography where you have a flash, right? So video lights, they help with that. Sorry, just give me a moment, please. I am trying to, uh, I am new to this. <laughs> it's a bit awkward. I am new to this. I am trying to make sure I show as much examples as possible because I gathered some files, but in order to get them on display, I need to navigate a little bit. So please, please pardon me. I need to get some files out. So while I'm doing that, I'm still going to continue with the session. Um, so, so yeah, so video lights are specific lights used for videography. Now you need this type of lights when you're indoors. Um, and sometimes when you're outdoors, when the conditions aren't favorable enough, maybe you're under a shade and it's too dark to shoot, you can support with a video light, but mostly they are used indoors. And um, you need a light tripod, of course. There are tripods that you use to set up um, to to which which you place your video lights on. And then we have a reflector. I have a link here that leads to a reflector. Sorry, let me switch the screen. Oh, it's already there. So the typical kind of reflector is this particular one here in this image. Now reflectors are used to bounce lights, um, to fill up the shadow areas of either a subject or an object. As you can see in this shot here, the lady is standing in front of the gentleman here holding the reflector. Now what the reflector does, now it's used in it's used outdoors, as you can see. I mentioned earlier there are some situations where you need to to um, you need light in outdoors, and this is one of the ways. What he's doing here is he's bouncing off the light from the sun onto the subject here, this lady, and as you can see, it's doing a lot to cover up the shadows on this side. Without it, the shadows would be very evident, and the the cameraman here might not get a clean shot, a good enough shot to work with. So he's directly bouncing um, the sunlight onto the shadow area of her face. So that's what you use a, a, tri a reflector for. Um, let's switch back to the slide, sorry. Okay, so that's for a reflector. And then we have a diffuser. Now the diffuser is used to soften light. Sometimes you have your light on and it may be too harsh. That's what you need to know. Uh, there are some situations where the light will become too harsh that the camera would be overexposed. No matter what settings you do, it might not be exposed enough. Like balanced enough for you to do um, a good to take a good shot so you would need a diffuser to diffuse the the lights to soften the light in order for you to have a clean image so let me click on that hyperlink so we can see exactly what the kind of diffuser i am talking about so now we have diffusers for um, photography we have diffusers for videography like i mentioned this is a perfect example of what I had mentioned earlier about the reflector. So it's literally bouncing the light off here to cover up the shadow parts of the gentleman's face while the lady here is filming. So that's exactly what the reflector does. Now the most typical kind of diffusers are these diffusers here. So what they do is they soften the lights. When the light is too harsh, um, I believe this is a video, a video light. When the light is too harsh, you use a diffuser to soften it so the image looks more pleasing, your subject looks more pleasing, um, and not feel the shadows that would be distracting, uh, or may not be the, the kind of look the person is going for in that moment. Let's say 
He wants a happy moment. He wants to film a happy moment. He wouldn't want it to look all contrasty and dark. If you're filming a villain, for example, you may you may want to deal away with um, reflectors, fillers, and all of that, and have that grungy, dark image, which would suit the mood. But in certain scenarios, or most scenarios, reflectors bounce bounce reflectors are used, and um, diffusers are used to cover up the shadows. So, um, okay, so the next one is microphone. Now, microphones are needed when you want to record audio, of course. And audio is a huge part of um, videography. Um, you can't actually tell a good story without audio. It may make sense to you to watch a video to an extent without audio, but then add audio to it, very good audio, mix it up very well and you'd have something magical at the end of the day. So that's why we say that it's, it's video is just 50% there. You need audio to carry video. Sometimes the video may not be so pleasing um, to the eyes, but with good audio, it's, it will totally make sense. And in order for you to record, let's say an ambient sound, let's say for the contest now, you, you are recording someone creating something whatever the person is creating and you need to use that sound in post-production let's say the person is a, is a carpenter or something right and he's hitting his wood doing a woodwork you might have to record the audio of him hitting the work because you need a cleaner audio using the the the, the microphone from your camera or your phone may not be clear enough and it will have a lot of interfering noises so using a microphone, a dedicated microphone, let's say a Zoom recorder, for instance, um, let me search for what that looks like. Say a Zoom recorder, for instance, which is used to record ambient sound most times. This is what a Zoom recorder looks like. So this type of recorder is used for recording audio. You can connect a microphone directly to it and connect it to your subject or you can use the microphones that are on top of it here, as you can see, to record ambient sound um, and use them in post-production when you are editing, right? So that's exactly what microphones are used for. You can also mic a subject, let's say you are interviewing someone, right? You're interviewing someone, you also need to mic that person. You connect, a, let's say, a lapel mic to the person and the person gives his interview and you take that audio, you merge it with your video and in post-production. And then at the end of the day, you have a clear audio. It will be different from when you are recording with your camera directly with the microphone of your camera because it will not be clear and you'd have a lot of interference. So I made mention of a gimbal earlier and I'm going to show you a short example of what it looks like on Wikipedia. Um, no, I clicked on the microphone again. Sorry about that. The gimbal. It's still taking me back to microphone. I think the hyperlink is not right. All right, so let's search for a gimbal, what it looks like. So this is what a gimbal looks like. I made mention of stabilization earlier when i was talking about the tripod a gimbal is also used to stabilize footages when you are moving when you're moving you need a gimbal because you your footage will definitely be shaky if you're following the subject with the camera in your hand except the camera has imbued stabilization even when the camera has imbued stabilization and your lens has imbued stabilization the result would likely be the same your footage is going to be shaky so that is where a gimbal comes to play. And as you can see, there are different types of, of um, stabilizers. This is a proper gimbal. And um, this is a different stabili stabilizer. It is a gimbal as well, but as you can see, the form is different. It's held in both sides. And actually stabilizing the camera on this might be more difficult than stabilizing it on something as simple as these other ones here. So when you want to make some movement shots, that's where your gimbal comes to play. 
So that's it for the basic um, photography equipment that you need. Um, if you think I missed anything, please mention. <laughs> anything you think I should talk about, please mention. Um, so they are, these are the basic ones. You need your camera, you need your lens, you need a storage device, you need um, your video tripod, um, video lights where necessary, you, the tripod for your lights, we have reflector, diffuser, microphone, gimbal. Now, all of these might not even be necessary. Most of these, rather, might not be necessary depending on um, the condition in which you're filming and what you're filming. Um, there are some things you film, you might not need um, a video light, you wouldn't need a video tripod, a reflector, diffuser, microphone, or a gimbal. Um, now, where you might not need a microphone to record audio, you might look at some platforms that you can get some free audio, like um, Pexels, for instance, um, that you can get some free audio and and download. Let's say you need um, the sound of cars, for instance, you check on those platforms, moving cars, you see it, and then you use it in your post production. So let's move on from here. <clears throat> so let's talk about camera settings. Now, when using a camera, you definitely need to, to set it for, for filming. Um, and one of the major things to set, first, the first thing you need to set is the exposure of your camera. Now, what exposure simply means is this. Sorry, let me just... Now, the amount of light that hits your camera sensor, it could be a digital camera, it could be your phone camera, they all have a sensor, right? Phone cameras have smaller sensors. Proper cameras, of course, have bigger sensors. And then we have um, um, some cameras that still have smaller sensors as well. And um, like some digital cameras actually have smaller sensors as well. Like we have the full frame cameras, those kind of sensors are big. We have cropped, um, frame cameras as well they have smaller uh, sensors and no so but then the, the the point is what affects exposure is light right and without light you can't even film right but then the amount of light that hits the camera sensor will determine the kind of exposure you have and then when you go out let's say you go outdoors and you're about to film and it's overly exposed so the thing is you can have balanced exposure, over expo exposure or under exposure. As, it's, as it is, it's self-explanatory. Balanced exposure means your, your image is properly exposed. It's not too bright, it's not too dark. Now, when an image is overexposed, it's too bright. And then if it's underexposed, it's too dark. It doesn't look as natural as when you see it with your eyes. And that is where these camera settings come to play. You need to dial some settings on your camera in order to get a balanced exposure. And um, there are three major dials that you, you dial on your camera in order to get a good exposure. So you have your shutter speed, you have the aperture, and then there's ISO. Now the shutter speed is dialed on the camera itself. Aperture is adjusted on the lens and as ISO is also done on the camera as well. So um, most times, let's say our mobile phone cameras, they have like auto exposure settings on them. You whip out your camera, you're about to take a picture, it makes the adjustments on its own so everything is balanced. But then there is a pro mode for most cameras and which is what I advise for people using mobile phones, you should check if your phone has a pro mode. Now, if your phone does not have a pro mode, then you need to look for a software with which you can then enhance the, the image quality, with which you can use to enhance the image quality of your camera so you can take better um, videos with your camera. And one of those, one of those software, sorry, I wish I can cast my phone. <laughs> One of those softwares. Um,
Okay, so one of those softwares, if you can see my screen, is this particular one here. I have used it countless times and it worked perfectly, perfectly well for me before I, I got my Samsung device that has a pro um, camera built into the device. So for those who may not have um, pro features on their, on their phone cameras, then definitely it would be advisable for you to get something as this because it will help you control your image better it's going to increase the quality of your image the moment you open the app you, you will tell that there is a difference and then there are some dials that you're going to to work on in order for you to have a good looking image and a balanced exposure then you in that app you can you can work on the exposure in a way that you have a good image at the end of the day but for cameras um for like the high-end cameras and some phones that have the pro features on them we have um, um you would see a dial for aperture mostly and iso you wouldn't see sorry i'm talking about phones now i'm sorry um on phones even the ones with pro features you may not see shutter speed you definitely see that for aperture and for iso so now let's get into what these mean let's get into what um, shutter speed means. Shutter speed cuts across both um, videography and photography, but in videography, it's quite different on how it is used. Now, shutter speed is is the amount of time, right? Your camera um, sensor is exposed to light while you are recording. Is the amount of of time your camera sensor stays exposed to light while you're recording now you can make adjustments to your shutter speed in order to to influence your exposure in order to make it darker or brighter now i have a hyperlink here that is going to take you to that lecture as well that's going to take you to um that's going to take you to a wiki page that does a proper explanation into what shutter speed is but basically what it does are two things. The shutter speed controls lighting, exposure that is. And the more you increase your shutter speed, the darker your image will become. If you decrease your shutter speed, the brighter the image will become, right? And <clears throat> the second thing it controls is effects. The more you increase the shutter speed, the choppy your image becomes, the sharper your image becomes, and in videography, the more you increase the shutter speed, the more likely you will get less blur, um, motion blur in your images. So when you pause, you see that the image will be crisp, clear, as if you took a photograph, right? But then when you reduce your shutter speed, you will have a more blurry image. Now, this can come in handy if you want to be stylistic with the kind of footage you're taking. But definitely for the contest, I would advise that you shoot at a regular shutter speed um something that would match with the frame rates of your your um your camera setting that you're working with we are going to get to frame rates shortly so most times if you want to be stylistic with it you can increase the shutter speed just like when some people are shooting war scenes they usually increase the shutter speed so you have this little bit of shaky footage going on and that typically depicts what's should be going on in a war scene or what's going on in the mind of people in that kind of scenario. No problem. Thank you. Of people in that kind of scenario. So that's what shutter speed does. So when you reduce the shutter speed, you can now have those dreamy and blurry kind of images. Let's say that's what you want to convey. So you have to be intentional about it. It's not just about set, dialing it up and dialing up. Why are you really doing that? What is the effect you hope to achieve with that? How can it help tell your story better? Like I mentioned earlier, in a war scene or a fight scene, it will be advisable or it's likely that you use um, a higher shutter speed because it helps convey the state of mind of the people in that scene to the audience. And in a, let's say somebody is drunk in the scene, and he's trying to make his way home. In order for you to depict that, what his mental state is, his vision and all of that, you might have to reduce your shutter speed as high, as low as possible. So you can have that blurry effect. So that's basically what it is used for. We are going to talk more about that later. Emmanuel? 
Hello, Emmanuel, do you want to say something? Okay. All go, go ahead, Green. Go ahead. All right. So let's talk about Aperture now. Um, I think on Wiki, PDR, yes, we have a perfect representation of what an Aperture is. Now, Aperture is the opening on the lens. Like I said earlier, Aperture is controlled with the lens, right? And then shutter speed is directly controlled on the camera, right? Because the shutter is there in the camera. So, but for Aperture, it's controlled with the lens. Now, let me open this image of this lens. As you can see, this is an image of a lens and you can see some blades here, right? So these, this, this is literally the aperture. Everything here you see is literally the aperture and these are the blades of the aperture. So now let me explain how that influences exposure. So the, the smaller the aperture of your lens, the less likely you would have light coming into the camera. And that is where, that is the major thing it affects. So it affects exposure directly. So, but the wider the lens, the wider the aperture of the lens, the more light it lets into the camera. So that's basically how it influences um, exposure. The, the smaller, the less, the less light it lets in, the wider, the more light it lets in. So that's what an aperture of the lens does. So there are a, but there's a particular dial on your, okay, so typically, the the aperture, I believe, when when um, lenses were being created, they they fashioned it in the form of the human eye. In um, uh, as you can see here, the pupil um, <clears throat> the pupil dilates when like you have a lot of light coming in, right? And then the pupil it goes in and it comes up open again. When it's widening up, you have less light coming in, like you don't see much light. So it does that automatically on its own. So the lens of the camera was fashioned um, to, to imitate the human eye. As you can see here, pupil dilating and relaxing as well. So that's basically what the aperture of the lens is and what it does. So there's a second thing it does. What it does is it also controls how blurry your image is, the background of your image. So let me look for an image on Google to see exactly an explanation of this. Aperture examples on images. If that works. All right, so we have this flower here. Let's check it out. All right, let's see if this image will be clear enough. Uh, it's redirecting me to another. Oh yeah, this this is a very good explanation of what an aperture does. As you can see here on this page, um, like I explained earlier, the wider the aperture, the more light it lets in, and the wider the aperture also, the blurry the background. As you can see, this is what it is. So the more the the smaller the aperture, if you're closing the aperture the less blurry the background. So you can have now sharp images in the, in the background, sharp images in the foreground and in the midground where your subject is as well. Everything is going to be sharp the more you close your aperture. And now we have aperture stops. These are aperture stops, the F, what you see up here, F1.4 up to F12. These are aperture stops. So if you're dialing it on your camera, every camera has it. Be it is a, whatever brand it is, it has it as long as it is a camera. And there's always a dial, a button for you to dial in order for you to control the aperture. So let's see an image of an aperture dial on a camera. Okay, it's redirecting me to a page that is taking so long to load. So let me just use the example on the side. 
Um, as you can see in this image here, I don't know if you can see it clearly, there is a dial up on this image. And there's also the ISO dial here as well. We are going to get to that. So there's a dial on the camera. In some cameras, it's at the front of the camera. In some cameras, it's where his thumb is. In some cameras, it's here. So it's all about navigating your camera to know exactly, because they all have it, to know exactly, okay, where can I find this dial? Where can I find this dial? The, the basic thing is to know exactly what those dials do and how they affect your image and how you can use the effects that it has on the image to tell a story. So let's go down to this image here. As you can see, in the first image with the aperture at 2.8, which means the aperture is really wide, it's really open. The image, the, the, the object in front, the flower in front here is sharp, but then the background is blurry. That's how you get a blurry background in some shots. That actually makes your image look nice in a way because it takes away the distraction and focus focuses on the subject. Here, the aperture is at f5.6, which means it is slightly closed to an extent. And you can see that even some of the, the objects here, some of the flowers here in the background that were initially blurred out on the first image are actually coming, um, are actually becoming clearer to see. And then we have aperture and aperture at f11.0. You can see that a lot of things are already in focus. So if you take it all the way up to f, f22, for instance, everything in front behind is going to be in focus. Everything is going to be sharp. So that's exactly what the aperture does in terms of the, this particular effect. But the major thing it does, the primary thing it does is it controls how much light gets into your image. So now the thing is, the more you increase your aperture to get a sharper, <clears throat> to get more images to look sharper and clear in, the, in your frame, the darker your image also becomes. So that is it. You need to know how these things work. Okay, I'm increasing the, the I'm increasing my, I'm, I'm increasing the aperture. What is going to happen to my image now? What is going to happen is the image is going to become sharper, but it's also going to become darker. I'm opening up the aperture, letting in more light. So the image is going to be brighter and more of what is in front of the camera is going to be in focus than the things behind. So that's basically um, what aperture does. Sorry, let me move this to the side. Um, all right, and then we have the ISO. I mentioned earlier that we are going to get back to that image. Let me that in. Yeah. All right, I mentioned earlier that we were going to get back to that image of um, the camera. Um, so I saw. Let me use this image as an example. All right, if you can clearly see the image by the right side of my screen, um, you can tell that from left to right, we go from a darker image to a brighter image. Now, this is done by dialing the ISO on your camera. Now, this is also available on pro versions of your phone. If you can go into the pro mode of your video camera or your photo camera, you'd also see the ISO. So what ISO basically does is it makes your image brighter. Now, it's something I would like to call um, um, artificial in a way. It simply increases the sensitivity of your, your camera to light. As basic, not necessarily to light, it increases it just like that. It's almost like when you are editing an image in post-production, you're increasing the brightness. It's not like it's actually affecting what the natural light actually looks or how much natural light is getting into the camera. It's now adding artificial lighting to make the image look brighter, as simple as that. There are so many examples here, from 100 to 2,500. Here is from 100 to 1,600. So at 100, your image is really going to be dark, all the way up to 1,600 is going to be brighter. And there's some cameras that even do more than that. Um, some cameras do up to 25,000 and more, right? So that's basically what the ISO does to your image. Now, the drawback to it is that the more you increase your ISO, 
the more likely your image is going to be noisy. You have that grainy thing in your image, grains like littered all over your image. So you need to be careful on how you increase the ISO of your camera. And especially if your camera is not an I like it's not a high-end camera, um, you're likely going to have a lot of noise in your footage. And those type of footages will likely be disqualified um, in the contest as well. So you need to look out for that. In post-production, post-processing, you might try to reduce um, the level of noise in your image as well. And in editing, even with pictures, in vid with videos, you can do that. With pictures, you can do that, depending on the editing app you're using. Um, so let's move on to something very important in videography, and that is what is called frame rate. Kyla, please can you mute your mic? Yeah, I can hear you. Please can you mute your mic? I can I get any feedback from you. And thank you very much. Um, so frame rate. Hello, Kyla. Okay, thank you very much. All right, frame rates. So let's talk about frame rates and how it affects your image. What frame rate simply means is the frequency at which consecutive images are captured by a camera in a moment of exposure. Now, there are different settings on the camera for frame rates and how much frames it can capture at a time. Like I explained earlier, a single image is a frame in itself. A single image is a frame. And then you have another image in videos. Now you have one image after another stacked together to create motion, right? So it's basically like you're taking series of photos of a particular action or set of actions, and then you're compiling them together to make what you know what you now know as a video. I also gave an example of pausing a video at every point. Any point you point, in, you pause a video, it is an image. It is a still image. It looks like what you would take with like a picture, right? So that's basically how frame rates work. Now, cameras record videos in frame rates as well. So the most typical one is 24 frames, recording at 24 frames, right? So <clears throat> that is how. The FPS here, sorry, I didn't explain what FPS is. Um, that's frame per second, right? So it's recording frames per second. Now, 24 frames here means that the camera is recording 24 different images stacked up together in one second. So that's basically what it is. Now, there's a hyperlink here as well. When you get the document, you can easily access it. It will take you to a YouTube page. Okay. Right now learn exactly what um, where you can learn exactly how frame rates work so typically you have the range for your regular kind of cameras your mid-range cameras you should have frame rates ranging from 24 frames to 120 frames some cameras have the uh, very expensive cameras have up to 120 frames and above like cinema standard cameras do have above 120 frames as well. And then there are some specialized cameras that are focused on, on, on frame rates, high frame rates that are used for slow motion. So a rule of thumb is to set the shutter speed of your camera to be double the frame rate for a smooth output. Now, if for the camera users, if you're using a camera, you need to, whatever frame rate it is on your camera, it will be on display on the screen. Um, let me look for an example of that. Your frame rate is going to be on display on the screen. With that, you can tell exactly how to make some adjustments in order to have um, smooth moving images. All right, give me a pause. Um, let's see some images on that. All right. Let me look for something suitable. On this particular um, 
image. I don't know if you can see this clearly. Um, there is 60p here, which is the frame rate which this cameraman is recording on. 60 frames. The p there means um, progressive, but it's actually 60 frames. If 60, you see there is 60 frames. Now he's recording 60 frames and his shutter speed, I was saying something about the rule of thumb for, for shutter speed, which is here. A rule of thumb is to set the shutter speed of your camera to be double the frame rate for a smooth output. Now, when you set your frame rate to 60 frames, for example, as it was set here on this camera, what it means is that you should double the shutter speed times two. So you would dial your shutter, which should be one of these buttons here. Like I said earlier, on different cameras, there are different, the dial for different things can be found at different areas. So you double it to 125 frames. Now, why you do that is because you want to have a smooth moving image. Everything is going to look smooth. But then there is a catch. The higher the frame rate, the, the, the smoother the slow motion you can get when you are reducing um, the speed. Hello, Caroline. Oh, thank you. The, the higher the frame rate, the more likely to have a smoother image. So to, to achieve a smooth slow motion, to achieve smooth slow motion when reducing the speed of videos, while editing footage, you're shooting at 60 frames and above is ideal because now you have more frames, a lot of frames stacked together, 60 frames, 50 frames, 120 frames. You can go all the way up to 1,000 plus frames for some cameras. Now, what that does is when you slow down the image, since there are a lot of frames in between, your image is going to look smoother in slow motion. All right. So... I, I think it's about time I show an example of how it works on an editing interface, or maybe I should leave that for later when I'm talking about editing. All right, so let's move on. So that's basically what frame rate is and what it does. Um, at 24 frames, it's ideal to record something that you don't need to slow down because you don't need to slow it down record it at 24 frames, and then you set your aperture to 50. So I said double the frame rate when you're setting your aperture so you can have a smooth image. And this is for people, okay? And this is for people that are, I'm sorry about that. And this is for people, um, this is for people that are shooting um, regular kind of images. You don't want to slow down your footage in post-production. That's exactly what you do. You record at 24 frames and all of that. So another thing you need to set is your white balance because you don't want your images to look a certain type of way. You don't want your images to look discolored. Sometimes you're filming and it's blue. Sometimes you're filming and it's all orange. So you need to set your white balance on your camera as well. It's also available on mobile devices as well. It's easy to do on pro mode on your phone. All you need to do is dial and you're going to get a pleasing looking image, something that looks more natural. And um, another thing to talk about is composition. Composition is very important. Um, it's what helps, it's what helps you, your viewer stay glued to your video. It's what helps a viewer stay interested in your video. They don't understand why the image looks so good, but it's because of how you arrange the elements in your image intentionally. So composition simply means how elements within a frame are arranged in order to create a desired look. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to move the, the, the elements around. You need to move with your camera to a certain position in order for the image to look the way you want it to look. So there are different elements in composition, of course, the elements are points, they are lines, they are shapes. Basically anything within the frame is the element of your composition. Now it depends on how you place your camera in order to get the best out of those elements. Now there are <clears throat> popular composition types. And now with these popular composition types, they help you set your images to help you compose your images to look better each time, right? 
So, so we have rule of thirds. Um, I would like to use examples from my, I would like to use examples from my project, but I am running out of time. Um, but let me see what I can do before I, I, I wrap up. All right, so this is a perfect um, image from my project that illustrates rule of third. Now, rule of third is, is something that has to do with, well, so to speak, imaginary lines on how you place your subjects in a frame. And um, mostly you place the subjects, to, um, there's usually a grid line. You can activate that on your phone when you are about to take images sometimes. You just click on grid, it activates on cameras, it activates as well. So it depends on where you place your subject in the image. So on this particular image, I can literally see it because I'm used to it, but you can't see it. So let me show you an example real quick. I need to wrap up anytime soon. I've spent so much time already trying to explain a lot. So um, rule of third, grid lines and camera display. So there's a psychology behind it. There's a psychology behind placing your object and um, your subject um, in an image for rule of third. Now, as you can see in the image on the right here, we have these red lines circle, these lines, the yellow lines circled at these points. Now, psychologically, what it's saying is if you place your objects in the image at certain points on and like in your frame, it is going to give a more visually appealing image. As you can see here in this wide shot of, of um, um, I think it's a, a waterfront or something. Um, as you can see in this wide shot, the subject, the objects are placed in a way that it looks visually appealing at the end of the day. Like they are intentionally placed at these points, like the church, if it's a church, I don't know what it is, the building, far out there is placed at this point. And you can see that the, the jetty here as well is placed at, at this intersected point here as well. So that basically explains what um, rule of third does. Now in my image here, now in my image here, since I already know this, I don't need to be going back and forth searching for what uh, trying to arrange the lines and all of that and setting the lines on my screen. I already know this is where I want to place my subject and that is why it looks pleasing. It looks natural and I'll leave enough space in front of him. It's called leading room, right? So you know that the subject is facing somewhere. In storytelling, it looks natural. If you keep your subject here while he's facing this direction, it means it should mean something. It should mean that the subject is caged in, it's sad or something. You used to convey those kind of um, emotions right so on this particular one nothing like that is going on is simply having a moment reading a newspaper and trying to know what um what the objects are about the weather and um, he is placed on this part so this type of framing is called rule of third right so then we have framing using people using objects filming through objects filming through anything that is called framing when you film through an object or subject, I'm trying to look for something, an example here. So this is a perfect, this is perfect framing here. Um, as you can see, I use the pillars here to frame my two subjects. And it's also given another form of, um, of composition, which is called symmetry. There's a balance between this side and this side of the image as well. Everything looks balanced on the left and the right. That's another form of composition going on there. And the main form of composition here is framing. So I'm framing these two subjects using the, 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 um, the pillar and the wall on the right. And if you look on this side, it's still framing here. This space hey, is here. Can you move to Love Africa program? Hello? Um, says Lima, please, can you move to mic? All right, so it's called framing, basically. Now you can frame using somebody's shoulder to like over the shoulder, it's another type of framing, over the shoulder framing, framing using someone's shoulder while viewing someone in front of them. There are so many ways to do framing. And then I just explained symmetry. 
Um, there's leading lines as well. Same image, the very same image has the same um, um, has the same leading lines here. If you look down to this point, you will see that the lines here, like I explained earlier, the elements of composition, lines, shapes, and all of that. So the lines here, I see that is leading my eyes to my subject is the lines on the ground here. The pillars arranged here like this are leading my eyes to the subject as well. So that's called leading lines. Um, Oh, I need to wrap up real quick. So that's about that. You can go ahead and read further about these other um, compositions when you get the document. So basically these are just explaining it. So working with lights, let's move on to working with light. Um, first off, let's start with working with natural lights because that is what you're going to be working with mostly since most of us would not be having um, camera equipments, so, um, like expensive camera equipments like lighting and all of that. So working with lights, basically you need to work with the sun and you need to know when to come out and shoot, the right time to come out and shoot. So one of the best times to shoot are early hours of the day and, um, and evening hours as well, in the evening, when the sun is not so harsh and it's at a place where it's given off this glow, you know, that orange glow. Um, it is called the golden hour in film, in in the film industry, in film terms, in videography, it's called the golden hour. It's not just videography, photography, uh, videography, it's called the golden hour. It's one of the best times to film or take a picture because the image would look better, it would look good, the colors are nice and soft. So early morning hours are one of those times to, to do that. Afternoon, not so much. You might have a problem with the sun. So, and that is exactly where um, a diffuser comes to play, like I explained earlier about what a diffuser does. As you can see in this in this video here, I was using the diffuser, I was using a diffuser to soften the light that was coming from the sun onto my subject here, this young lady, before I started filming. But then I still encountered a little bit of a problem while filming. Um, it was still harsh, so I had to dial down, I had to play with my aperture, ISO, and shutter speed in order to get the perfect balance. So that's exactly why you need to work on those settings as well in order to get a perfect balance. So that's exactly how to film. When you don't have a choice, you have to film outdoors and you have to must film under the sun. That is exactly where a diffuser comes to play. And when you're using a light as well, a diffuser comes to play there to make your light your lights um, um, soft. So there is something called the three-point lighting technique. Um, it is a technique used for filming indoors mostly. Um, it's also used for filming outdoors, but that is, uh, let me show you an image here. So if you have lights to play with when you're creating your contents for the contest, you can do the three points lighting technique. Now you have a key light, which is the main light on your subject. You have a fill light, which covers the shadow area of your subject. And then you have back lighting, which should be a light behind your subject, but this subject here doesn't have backlighting. So that's basically the three points lighting techniques you can use. Um, like I explained, main light, fill light, backlight. So now storytelling with videography, we are almost at the end. Oh yes, we are at the end already. Storytelling with videography. Um, you need to be very intentional about what you're doing. You need to know that, okay, I am filming this. What emotion do I want to pass while filming this? I have learned a little about how to use my camera, how to set camera settings and all of that, and how to take certain kind of shots, composition, especially. I would advise that we do a deep research on composition because that is going to greatly enhance the quality of your, your image and storytelling as well. So you've learned about all of these. How do you then put them all together and create a pleasing looking image and create, sorry, and actually tell a compelling story. That is where it happens in the editing process. Storytelling with videography mostly happens in the editing process where you start to piece everything together. Everything should make logical sense. We should have a logical beginning, something like starting up with an opening shot, a, an establishing shot for an, as an example. Um, say I want to film I want to tell a story about somebody 
within a particular environment or in a building. I would start with filming the building, logically. Now, in Good Yesterday, in uh, not Good Yesterday, sorry, um, Dream Home, which is the winning video for 2022. Let me play that. Pardon me. I can't tell where it is. All right, so let me go back. So in this video, the scene opens with establishing the scene, where we are going, okay, where are we, the environment, right? So it's making a logical sense. Okay, this is an environment. You see that in movies, you see that in documentaries, you see that everywhere when people are actually editing because they have the knowledge of this, but some people don't. That is, if you're telling, if you're making videos that should tell a complete story, there should be some form of establishing shots. Some form of it, it might not be as wide as this, it might not be the building, but then let it be establishing, let it give the audience a sense of where they are. Before we then moved to where the young girl was sleeping in her room. And one thing to note again is framing here, please. Um, so I framed with the door here, and here she is. Framing adds some sense of quality to your image. So this is framing going on here. And um, so we moved on to the next scene, to the next. So everything was making a logical sense. We followed her through her journey through the city up onto her, up until she got to her school. This is also called framing. And over the shoulder as well, I was filming from the driver's shoulder. And then we also have framing here on the screen of the, of the, of the taxi. It's framing um, the street ahead. So this is a, a wide shot establishing where we are going to. Um, there's a lot going on here as well. I see leading lines, the lines on, on the um, the lines on the uh, the window of the car, and the door that leads to her, and all of that. Rule of third, she is kept on this side of the screen, and then leading the room, which is in front of her, to create space, and all of that. So that's it. Rule of third here as well. So we logically followed her to her school. As, as you can notice, there's framing going on here as well with the lady's body. All these things add a little bit of quality to your, to your video. Okay, what happened there is the transition effect. So sometimes you can do transitions as well, but make them as natural as possible since it is, um, since it is going on um, Wikimedia. It is not some other kind of context because these contents have to be reused. So when you use um, inbuilt transitions on your editing apps, it takes away from the story. So I tried my best not to do that and do a natural transition with that. So that's something you can also um, apply when editing. And, um, and then there's this lighting technique that we'll use here. Initially, initially we, I was working with the light from the bulb, but at this particular moment and this shot, I only worked with one light. So it's possible for you to work with one light as well, but do a lot of backlighting if you have a good source of um, fill light or main light on your character. So what I did here was use the book in his hand to do the fill lighting for the shadow part of his face. So you can see this part of his face while I kept another light here and I dialed the temperature to warm, depicting that of a ball actually. So that's one other technique you can use. Use a lot of backlighting. If you don't have a lot of light, you can use a single light even in a dark space. Um, so that's basically it for that. Sorry, let me shut this down. Uh, so editing apps that you can use um, for editing, what I use on PC that is on laptops, in my computer is um, Premiere Pro, which is the most popular one, and DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve is by Hi. Black. Hello, Anther. <laughs> which is on DaVinci, which is DaVinci yeah, Resolve. Yeah, hello. <laughs> I, I'm coming okay. back, I had to move to my car. <laughs> You're welcome back. <laughs> All right, so um, DaVinci Resolve is the software, my favorite software that I use for editing. Um, basically, this is what it looks like. This is what the interface looks like. It's very simple, straightforward. Um, same with Premiere Pro um, editing interface. Now these editing interfaces, they cut across, they all look, they have, just as with cameras at different 
from different brands, but they have similarities cut across. These editing softwares do the same thing. Premiere Pro does the same as DaVinci Resolve would do. They all do the same thing. You just need to figure out exactly how do I go ahead to work. Okay, I want to cut a clip. How do they do it here and how do they do it here? It's as simple as that. So, but on mobile, um, InShot is a very popular one on mobile. Let me get some images of some mobile editing softwares. Um, mobile video editing. Editing apps. All right, so like I said earlier, InShot is the most popular one, and that is why it's even the first thing you see on your search. We have Filmora, that's a popular name. And then there's CapCut. CapCut is the thing now, almost everybody is using CapCut. And they have CapCut for PC as well, for computers as well. But then it has a simpler interface as compared to DaVinci Resolve, um, for example. DaVinci Resolve is more complex, it's more detailed, it's more it's deeper, but um, CapCut is simple for people who want to make simple cuts. And you can actually use that to do to, to edit whatever you want to edit, but make sure they have a logical sense of progression, a logical sense of sequence. So you have a beginning, you have a middle, and then you have an end, and the end should feel satisfying. Like, oh wow, this actually feels like the end. This is how it ought to end. For this year, we are talking about the process. So even when you're filming a process, even if you might not film the final product, give it a sense of story, give it a sense of progression, um, as I just explained. So I'm sorry. Oh, this is so. <laughs> All right, so um, cutting, choosing music, the impact sound effects made, color grading. These are all the other things you need to bring into your editing when you're editing to make to tell a more compelling story. So when you're cutting, you cut only the important moments. <clears throat> Sorry. You cut only the important moments. You don't just cut randomly and list things together. So you should cut in a way that only the important moments ought to be showing in the cut. You remove the parts that are not important, remove them. And then choosing music, you need to choose the right music for the right moment. Let me go back to Dream Home for a moment. <clears throat> no, let me go to um, Good Yesterdays because we have like different moments with different sounds. Um, Wilson, can you hear the, the sound from the video? No, I can't hear it. You can't hear it. Okay. You need to share. When you click share, you need to click when you when you share, you need to click the play okay. or the share audio button. Click play oh. audio. So oh. just before you click share. Just before I click share. Okay, let me try that now. Sorry, give me a sec. Okay. Mm. I did not get that option, but let's move on from there. I don't know why I didn't appear. All right, but let's move on. So you need to choose the right music for the right moment. If it is a, a, just an example, if it's an exciting moment, you need to know the kind of music to use for such moments and where to get such music from. So they have to be <clears throat> Creative Commons kind of, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Creative Commons licensed music, because that's what's suitable for the contest as per the rules. You need to use Creative Commons kind of music. Now, there are certain platforms where you get this. You get it directly from YouTube. Um, in the YouTube audio library, there are a lot of free Creative Commons uh, music that you can use there. And I'm pretty sure um, the upload wizard is going to identify the music to give the appropriate credit to the creator of that music. So you need to use those kind of music because if you use if you use um, 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 a licensed music that is licensed not for free, you don't you can't use it for free. Um, music with copyright, then you are going to get a copyright strike on the platform, and your 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 video is going to be taken down. Just like when you upload 
those kind of videos on and your video will be taken down as well. So you need to look for those kind of platforms. And such one of such platform is Pixabay. Um, if you can see it on the screen, this is Pixabay. You can come to pixabay.com and search for <clears throat> free license <clears throat> music that are free from um, copyright free music. But you still need to be careful because some of them are licensed as well. Like an example here is this one. So there's content ID attached to this particular audio. So you need to look for the ones that don't have content ID. You test them out to see how good they sound, if they would suit the mood that you want to convey in that particular scene of your video or not. So if it goes from exciting to a sad moment, then you need to transition that way. If you're going into a sad moment, you use a sad a music that would typically depict that as well. Then, um, <clears throat> so the impact of sound effects, you can also use sound effects. Oh, I wish I could share my, um, my videos, um, the audio from the videos. So sound effects as uh, a couple of, <clears throat> of sound packs you can use to enhance your, to enhance the mood in your video. Um, you hear them a lot in, in uh, movies. Sometimes they use high pitched riser sound effects to enhance moments of, of, um, of, of um, let's say joy, yeah. And also moments of sadness. Sometimes they use sound effects for that. Moments of shock, especially and all of that so sound effects help do that color grading is another thing that helps um, tell a story in your editing let me go back to to good yesterdays can you see the screen please wilson can you see so i can know that i can tell if everyone else can see so what i can see okay. mm -hmm. I'm seeing the, the slides still. The slides still. Okay, let me switch. Sorry. Okay. I think I hear an audio in the background. Oh, you do, you do, you do. Oh, that's great. That's great. So I can. Can you see the video? Not yet. Still the slides. Yes. Yeah. Editing apps. Okay, okay. Can, can you see. try? Yes, closing the share is. yeah here it is now awesome now we see the video can you hear the audio mm, not so clearly from my end hillary can you hear the audio clear all right so for this particular i was talking about colors now for this particular scene um the opening scene the colors were very normal looking um, depicting modern time, right? You can use color to tell um, the setting of a particular movie or a particular scene as well. Um, let's say movies that were that depict the '90s, let's say early '90s, would typically have a washed out kind of look as compared to something like this. So this is giving us that modern feel. I had to color grade it to make it look modern. Everything, the colors are bright. Everything is good. But when it got to the scene where she starts to reminisce, where she starts to remember the past, let me move into that scene now. Okay, so this is where it starts. I washed out the colors a bit um, to make it look like, okay, it's actually in the past. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways to convey all, all up to this point. The colors are not as bright and saturated as the other scenes. So now these scenes in comparison with this scene now that follows up, you see that the colors here are brighter and clearer and all of that. So that's one of the ways you can use colors also to tell stories, to convey a message. Sometimes it could be black and white. If you go into the memory of somebody, it depends on your choice. And if it depends on if it's a film as well, if it's a documentary, it's not necessary. You use your normal colors. But color in a way that everything looks balanced and not out of place. Your image is not too dark. Your image is not too bright. Your image is balanced. So that's basically all for it right now. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, Wilson. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, for those who stayed this long. <laughs>